certain bands. And yes, you know, I'm going to quote to you too. One of their better known songs is titled, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. It's a song about wanting and searching for meaning. And I think that this is an appropriate song for this passage that we just read in Mark, which describes a man who runs to Jesus, who kneels at his feet and asks an existential question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, on the surface, this man seems to have it all together. He's got possessions. He seems to be finely dressed. His bills are paid. He's been blessed, and he's godly. And yet, he's run to Jesus. Despite all of these blessings, despite his piety, he recognizes that something is missing in his life. He seems consumed with a longing for something more, something that will link the here and now to the eternal. For whatever reason, this man believed that Jesus could put him on the track to get that more that his heart was craving. There must be something else to do that will make a life that is really life, that will fulfill me. And Jesus will help this guy to find what he's looking for. Now, the location where this discussion occurred is important, as are Mark's words regarding it. And they're obscured in the English language. The English translation simply reads, he, meaning Jesus, was setting out on a journey. The Greek reads like this, Jesus is setting out into the way. Now the way for Mark is crucial. And chapters 8 through 10 in this book concentrate on the way. Jesus is the way, and he is setting out into the way. The way which will lead to Jerusalem, it will lead to the cross, but it will also lead to resurrection and new life. So Jesus is trying to elaborate on what it means to really follow, what it means to be a disciple and this path of discipleship. Thus, the answer to this man's question should come as no surprise to the disciples or to us. Of course, Jesus is going to talk about following and the way. And yet, his answers are, at the very least, disconcerting. We are told that after the young man assured Jesus that he, in, he did indeed keep all of the commandments, Jesus looked at him. He loved him. And then he promptly told him to sell everything that he had, give it all to the poor, and then join this traveling ministry band that he's come across. Truth is, maybe we would have preferred that Jesus said to this man, great job, you're doing really well. Relax, you've got it all under control. You're good, just as you are. You've been a good person. You've been a stand-up, pious man. You've been a model to your peers. You don't need to change a thing. Seems like this guy is well within the bounds of reason if he thinks that Jesus will 
tell him this. We'll tell him that. He's fine just as he is. Because he's followed the rules of his religion and his culture. By any earthly standard, he's a cut kind above. Of and he probably deserves some recognition for this. Some congratulations on his excellent life choices. It's certainly easy to imagine that the disciples who are watching this scene thinks, think that's what should occur. That the man should get a little bit of recognition. And instead, Mark tells us that Jesus looks at him and loves him. He doesn't say, you're fine, just as you are. He loves him instead. He loves him without any conditions. It's almost like he's indifferent to any of the accolades that this man seems to have accumulated on his way. It matters that the fact that Jesus says he loves him before he invites the man to completely change his life completely ask him to turn his life upside down for the sake of the kingdom of God. Jesus' love is not dependent upon the man's receiving it. It's freely given. Makes you wonder the next time we sing, Jesus loves me, maybe we should pay a little more attention to what God may be asking us to do. Jesus knows this guy is a good guy, and he takes his religion seriously. He knows he's a good person with his track record. Jesus loves the guy, which, by the way, is the only time in the whole Gospel of Mark that Jesus is said to love anybody. But Jesus also knows that something is not right with this this man seems to have all the outward appearances of godliness, but somehow his heart is wanting for more. It's not in the right place, and the man knows it. Jesus knows it. There's only one way for Jesus to expose that heart. He tightens the screws. He goes after the guy with the first commandment. The one that not even this rich, pious, young ruler can possibly keep. Thou shall have no other gods before me. But this man did have other gods before him. Himself and his money. And there was only one way to show the man this truth that he was avoiding. He would have to let go of the money and his desire to be in control. You have one thing, go sell it, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. This young man was aching for something, maybe a bit more peace, maybe a bit more joy, maybe a bit of one thing more than another, but he probably wasn't bargaining for a whole life transformation. Lots of people are prepared to try religion in order to satisfy some like spiritual nagging, you know, the I'm spiritual but not religious folks, but they're not particularly in for a life overhaul. And it's fairly evident from the way that Mark tells the story that the man was not anticipating this either. He just wanted a bit more. There must be one more thing to do, one thing that's missing that will nicely round out my good life. Surely that thing that I've still not found cannot be letting go of my money. Cannot be letting go of how my life is currently arranged. I didn't ask for a whole life overhaul, good teacher. 
but over and over and over again. What we see when we come into Christ's presence, when we fall on our knees, when we ask for the more that our hearts crave, Jesus isn't satisfied to give us some spiritual spruce up or a little fine-tuning in the jiffy lube line of fast lane church and then say, now off you go, you're good. He's not particularly interested in a religious makeover. Instead, he wants us to be a whole new being. Jesus gives himself to us and then asks us to follow him in a whole new direction into the way. Jesus shifts this man attention away from himself and his possessions, his concern for himself, and into something that's quite a bit more to the kingdom of God. He invites the man not to add one more thing to his list of already, but to give himself up to something beyond his wildest expectations. Jesus invites him to stop fretting about what may be missing and to dive in with reckless abandon into what God is doing, not somewhere in the future, but right now, in the here and now. He's saying, give up your fears, give up your goods, give up your bondages, give up your need to be in control, whatever it is, give it up. Everything that doesn't ultimately satisfy you, give it up and follow. Put your trust in God. And this is hard, truth be told. Giving up our desire and putting our trust in God with a capital G. Not in our own little gods with a small g. It goes against everything we've been told all our lives about what the recipe for success and happiness is. Get more. Be more. Upward mobility. All the influence. The list goes on. Our gods, our little gods, are many. And this is why Jesus sums it all up by saying it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The issue is not how much money is too much. The issue is not who is rich and who is not. Rather, the issue is who do you trust? Do you trust yourself? money and your good works, your popularity, all these little gods that we have, or do you trust the big God, the one who comes to us in and through Jesus and asks us to follow? The disciples, who were probably impressed with this rich and powerful young man, were amazed. They were probably shocked. If this man couldn't qualify to be a disciple, who could? The demand that Jesus made of this man was ridiculous. It was impossible to keep. It is impossible to keep. If this is what it takes to be a disciple, if this is what it takes to be saved, then no one can be saved because no one is worthy. And that's precisely the point that Jesus is trying to make. Trying to make to this rich, young guy, to the disciples, and then to us. As long as we continue to ask, what must I do? As long as we think that our deeds or our money or our church attendance will count for something, as long as we think we can do something, to win God's approval, then we're stuck. And we'll never make it. 
We are like that camel stuck in the eye of the needle. We are like that man who walked away from Jesus because it was impossible for him to give away his gods and trust Jesus. When we come to this realization, then Jesus has got us right where he wants us. When the disciples wondered if it would ever be possible for anyone to do what Jesus demanded, Jesus had them right where he wanted them. What is impossible for us, for the rich man, and for those disciples is possible for God. In fact, that is precisely the claim that Jesus was making for himself. That's why he came into this world to accomplish the impossible, to do what only God can do, to pull us along with all those other camels through the eye of that needle. The God that we are dealing with, the God who is pointed to through Jesus and Jesus is ever pointing towards and calling us to is not overwhelmed by the logistics of this problem. Our God can walk a camel through the eye of a needle. And I think that's finally the answer to the rich man's question and the things that can ultimately satisfy our soul. The answer is that you and I can't do anything to inherit eternal life. You and I can't do anything to secure our place in the kingdom of God. We can only receive it and let it make a claim on us. Thy will be done earth as it is in heaven. I told the story before of John Buchanan. He's a retired minister from the First Presbyterian Church of Chicago where he served for more than 50 years. He was baptizing a two-year-old boy and as he put his hand on the boy's head and, and said, you are a child of God and sealed by the Spirit in your baptism, you belong to Jesus Christ forever. And as he was pouring water over the little boy's head, saying, you are Christ's forever, the little boy looked up and said, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh indeed. When Jesus looks at this man and loves him, when he looks at us and loves us, it's with a love that puts a claim on us. The love of God is not a passive, pat us on the head kind of love, but a passion that overwhelms, that consumes and that compels us out of an old life wanting to be in a new one. Perhaps the reason that the gospel is often talked about as good news for the poor as the poor tend to have a pretty good idea and really want a new world, a new life. They're not particularly thrown by this topsy-turvy way of Jesus. Many of the first will be last and the last will be first. It's those of us who are pretty happy with the current order of things who struggle with this idea. Because when we find ourselves face to face with Jesus, when he, we see the love which he looks at us with, the lengths which Jesus is prepared to go, it demands a response from us. He will not be an accessory to our best laid plans. His love is not coercive, but he does expect a response. It brings to mind when I survey the wondrous cross, which says, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, 
so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. This is maybe why Jesus gets a little testy with Peter at the end of the passage. Peter wants to take a moment and remind Jesus of just how much they've given up to follow this man. And Jesus says, look, pay attention, Peter, what you're going to give up, what you have given up for God's sake in the new world order will not matter. You will have way, way more because you got caught up in this love. Peter's response kind of also reminds us that there are lots of ways that we try to earn our way into the kingdom, earn our way into God's grace, not just good behavior and full bank accounts. It's a kind of spiritual arrogance running out of Peter's mouth, which is not surprising. But it's dividing and dangerous just as protective, just like those little gods of us are. The way of Jesus challenges all the ways in which we let our confidence rest in ourselves and not turn it over to God, where all of these little gods get in our way. Try as we might, we're never going to get that camel through. We need more. We need God. The kingdom of God that Jesus is talking about is not simply someday and somewhere else. Obviously, its fullness is not here, and we have a hope for something not yet seen. But what Jesus is talking about to the disciples and to the questioning man is a present reality in this life and in the age to come. Eternity is now. Heaven is breaking in, has broken in, here and now. And Jesus invites us to be part of that. It isn't a question about God's goodness and grace eventually, but about the will and the way of Jesus shaping the here and the now. In the presence of Jesus, business as usual is not on the menu. He looks at us and says, you are too important for business as usual. He's looking at us and heaven help us, loving us and inviting us into his kingdom of hope and peace and joy and grace and love abundant life, asking us to let it claim us and hold us and to get caught up in it. He's looking at us and loving us and offering the chance to let all we are and all we have become bound up in the extravagance of God's love. And the question hangs before us just as it did for the rich young man and for the disciples. Have you found what you're looking for? Jesus bids us to come and follow him into the way. Our hymn is hymn number 724, O Jesus, I Have Promised, and we will be 